What if I told you that even though the newspaper says that Sabo killed King Cobra, the Revolutionary Army and Alabasta will still make an alliance? What if I also told you that this alliance is revolved around the Joy Boy? Yeah, not only Luffy, but also the one from the Void Century. The evidence that I found for this mega theory is actually insane, and I promise it will completely blow your mind. Throughout the video, I'll explain why Alabasta will be allied with the Revolutionary Army, who the new King of Alabasta will be, how Alabasta, Shandora, Wano, Elbaf, and the revolutionaries prove who Joy Boy was. Egyptian mythologies direct parallel with Alabasta and Nika, Nico Robin's connection to all of this, and lastly, I'll explain what happened to Alabasta in the Void Century and how it was paralleled in the story. If you like One Piece content that dives deep into its biggest mysteries, then make sure you subscribe to the channel and even hit that notification bell just like Luffy and Skypea. And so now without further ado, let's get into it. So to start off, let's discuss how Koza will be the new king or ruler of Alabasta. Now I know I've discussed this before in previous videos, but I still have to bring it up to get the whole picture of Alabasta's true purpose with the revolutionaries. So all the way back to Vivi and Koza's flashback, we see Koza save Vivi from criminals. After this, we see the king of Alabasta thanking him and asking him if he loves this country. Koza replies, I do, and we see somewhat a similarity with him and the king as they both bond through the love of their country. Right after this, we see Cobra talking to Eagerdom about how he's worried that Vivi is too nice to be the ruler of Alabasta. He states how Vivi can't make a tough decision. Then, he sort of hints at thinking that Koza would be a better fit for a leader since he can make tough decisions that would benefit the country. This may be foreshadowing to Koza becoming the king one day, while Vivi may be a straw hat, or at least not a full on leader of Alabasta. I also do expect her to eventually join the straw hats because of how things ended in Alabasta. The next hint at Koza being the leader of Alabasta is the simple fact that Vivi's nickname for him is literally Leader. Now she called him this ever since they were kids and he became the leader of their little group, but even as adults, she still continued to call him it. If later on in the story Vivi still called him Leader when she was the leader of Alabasta, don't you think that that would be kind of weird? I think it just feel right if she called him Leader with him being the leader and not her. He also definitely shows the traits and qualities of being a strong leader when he fights for the people in the Alabasta Saga. This shows his true love for the people and their justice. Even though he was tricked by Croc, he still loves Alabasta just as much as anyone else. He will do whatever it takes to do right by the people of Alabasta. In Vivi's flashback, we even see the king send off Koza and his father to build the city of Yuba. Cobra even relied on Toto to represent it. Now this shows that Koza and his family already have major political influence in the country of Alabasta which means that the people will most likely choose him to be their king through the tough times without the Nevaltari family. With the king dead and Vivi missing, Koza will end up being the only guy who can get Alabasta through these stressful times. The kingdom doesn't even have any of the main guards since they all went to the reverie and still haven't returned. I also feel like Cobra had the choice for Koza to stay back home because he knew that something would go down at the reverie. I feel like he told Koza to stay back while everyone else leaves because he's one of the one guys who would put his life on the line for the country and defend them. It almost seemed as if the king knew his death was coming real soon since he's sick and says how he might not last much longer. We also see that he's determined to go to the reverie to ask the world government questions about the void century. We see later that he's secretly meeting with the Gorosei and they're wondering if he found something out. I believe that in his mind he was ready to die at the reverie for the truth of the world and the truth of Alabasta. If he knew the possibility of death at the Reverie, he may have explained to Koza the importance of the situation and may have told him that if anything happens to him, don't trust the world government. Ever since Cobra met Nico Robin, he's been looking into the conspiracies of the world and has been wondering what the celestial dragons are trying to hide. Now that we know he actually died from Sabo, I still believe something a bit more complex happened than just what the newspapers told us. However it looks, I believe Sabo accidentally killed King Cobra or was framed. And before I get into anything else, I think Sabo actually did kill Cobra 
Cobra, even if it was an accident, because it seems like the Morgans didn't completely lie about anything in the news this time. They may have spiced up the stories, but they didn't take anything out or change anything that they learned. We know this is true because in chapter 956, we see that the government sent a Cypherpool member to make Morgans cover up a story. He says how he'll never cover up a story that's this big, which means he didn't cover up anything that happened at the Reverie. He even says how he'll do anything for money, but at his core, he's still a journalist and he still decides what should be in the newspapers. Also notice how he's on the run from the government, showing that he's not going to listen to them. So now that you understand why I think everything that we learned from the newspapers with Alabasta and the Reverie weren't completely lies, let me tell you what else I think happened there. Another thing we learned that happened at the Reverie is that Vivi went missing, so something weird seems to be going on. I mean, it did seem as if Emu wanted to kill Vivi and erase the Nefletari family from history, which could explain how and why Vivi went missing. This could either be a good thing or a bad thing. She could have either been captured by the world government or escaped with Sabo. I think the latter more likely happened because she knows Sabo is Luffy's brother and he could have realized what the government wanted to do to the Nefletari family when he supposedly killed Cobra. He could have explained to her how what happened with Cobra is a misunderstanding and what's really going on. Vivi was probably forced to take Sabo's hand because if she didn't, then it would be the end for her. Vivi trusts Luffy more than anyone in the world, which means she would probably sense that something's not right with his brother doing such an evil thing. This also all becomes more interesting if Alabasta already met the revolutionaries in the past, which is something I'll be getting into throughout the video. And by the way, if you want to know what I think happened to Vivi and how I predicted that she'd go missing, check out one of these two videos. So with all this being said, I believe Salvo and the revolutionaries will head to Alabasta to try to clear things up or apologize with Vivi or even without her. Alabasta seems to not be doing too well right now after everything that happened, so they definitely deserve to at least talk to the revolutionaries about what happened. Now this is where I think an alliance will be made or has already been made secretly with the two forces. So with Koza as the new leader right now, he will probably be the one to talk to Sabo. This meeting may be one of fate since Koza and Sabo seem to be connected or possibly even family. I believe Koza becoming an ally with or an actual revolutionary will make sense since Oda seemed to have foreshadowed it all the way back in Alabasta. In case you forgot, Koza literally was the face of the Alabasta Revolutionary Army, just like how Sabo is now the face of the actual Revolutionary Army. Another connection would be that if you take a close look at the both of them, it almost looks as if they are related. They both even have that symbolic symbol of the left eye scar. I personally believe that they may somehow be long lost cousins or family members. We know that Sabo's family is one that is elite and wealthy and that is very close to the Celestial Dragons. We also know that Koza's family is very close and trusted by a former Celestial Dragon. With this, I wouldn't find it too surprising if both of their family lines were once together but ended up splitting up as one left for Alabasta while the rest headed to Goa Kingdom. This could have happened in the Void Century when one side of the family stayed with the Celestial Dragons while the other side didn't because they left when the Nefatari family left the 20 royal families. If these two were in fact related in some way, I wonder if they already knew each other or will realize it when they meet. I believe Koza already met with the revolutionaries or at least likes them because of a small detail that he's shown us. Before I tell you what the detail is, let me explain another theory on our channel that predicted how Sabo will be the face of the revolutionaries and known throughout the whole world as a hero. This will be important to why Koza may have already been a revolutionary, so pay close attention to these details. So basically, the theory goes that Sabo and what he wears is the symbol of the revolutionaries. In the Three Brothers flashback, we see that Sabo wore a top hat that had goggles right over them. This shows that it's always been his thing and his little fashion design, just like how Luffy wears the straw hat. Now you may say, well what does this have to do with anything? Well, Preach explains and analyzes that this exact style of clothing is a symbol for the revolutionaries since after Sabo joined, they all began to wear the same thing just like him. We see Bello Betty, Morley, and Lindbergh all wearing the same thing. We also know that they started wearing this after they met Sabo or at least after becoming revolutionaries because of Koala. We see Koala in the Fishman Island arc as a little girl. Notice how she's not wearing the hat or the goggles when she's a youth. However, later on when she's a revolutionary, she wears the exact same thing as the rest of the commanders previously mentioned. This proves that they wear it after they meet Sabo. Another little detail that Preach brings up in the theory is that in Dress Rosa, the arc where Nico Robin meets 
meets up with the revolutionaries, she starts to wear a hat with the sunglasses over it. Now she probably doesn't have a top hat or goggles on her at all times, so she most likely did what she could to resemble the revolutionaries. Okay, so now you may ask, well what does this have to do with Koza and Alabasta? Well if you take a look at Koza in the post time skip, notice how he's wearing goggles around his neck even though he has glasses on. This looks identical to how Saba wears them when he isn't wearing a hat, so this puts up the three questions. Did Koza already have ties with the revolutionaries? Is he just inspired by them? Or is this all just a coincidence? I come to the belief that it's one of the first two options because I don't believe in coincidences when it comes to One Piece, just like how Ray Lee doesn't. Even if he never had any association to the revolutionaries, this is a little hint to the fact that he'll become one one day and that he has a direct connection with Sabo. So now with Sabo and Koza meeting up to clear things up, I believe Koza will believe him because like I said earlier, the king may have told him to stay back in Alabasta because he trusts him more than anyone to protect them. If the king truly did know that it was his last outing of his life, since he knew he was gonna press the five elders, and since he was already dying, he may have even gone as far to tell Koza some of the biggest secrets of Alabasta and what he was planning to do. If the king brought up Nico Robin to him, like how he brings her up to the rest of his men, this may be where Koza also started wondering about the revolutionaries and not trusting the world government. If anyone were to deserve to learn what truly happened to Alabasta with Croc, Luffy, and Robin, it would be Koza since he was the one who was tricked by Croc. He already learned that it was all orchestrated by Croc and Broke works in the Alabasta arc but he doesn't know the details of why they did it, what Pluton is, and what Poneglyphs are. He most likely learned this directly from the king himself sometime after the arc ended. If he has any idea how the Void Century may be involved with this, it may have piqued some interest for him and Sabo and their army. With this being said, he's also the one guy to not be fooled by what the newspapers say since he's already been fooled once in the pre-time skip and probably learned his lesson. This would also allow him to be the only guy in Alabasta to even be able to discuss with Sabo and to become allies with him. Everyone else that lives there probably hates Sabo after what he did, but Koza was probably more rational about the situation and was wondering what really went down. He knew it was Luffy who saved him and Alabasta from Krog, but then the government labeled it as Smoker and as as the Navy. So just like how he's already seen the world government drastically lie once for them to look good in the eye of the public, he probably believes that they can do it again at the Reverie. In a way, every single thing that happened in Alabasta somewhat helped their current situation of being on the opposite side of the world government in the final war. Some more hints throughout the story that Alabasta will be connected with the revolutionaries has to do with Croc and Robin. Apparently the revolutionaries were always looking for Nico Robin but could never find her since she was either on the run or hiding out with Crocodile. Of course, Croc also has a past with certain revolutionaries, which is Ivankov. Surprisingly, he even hired someone who looked up to Ivankov, which is Bonchan. There are already certain connections with them in this arc. Well, going back to how Robin was there this whole time, the revolutionaries must have found out about this as the news came out. Once they did, I can see them going to Alabasta to ask questions about Robin and what happened. They probably wanted to know where she went so they could obtain her. But then of course, they all find out later that this whole time, she actually became a straw hat and was saved by Luffy at Ennis Lobby. The revolutionaries may have looked around for her after they went to Alabasta, but of course they couldn't find her since she was up in the sky for a while. This could have been where Sabo and Koza first met or where Alabasta at least first began to understand and become closer with the revolutionaries. Of course, eventually they actually obtained Robin for a few years during the time skip and she could have told them everything she learned while in Alabasta and other things as well. She could have told them about Luffy and how he's very close with the kingdom. This may have helped the relationship even more since the revolutionaries have obvious ties with Luffy with characters like Dragon, Sabo, and Robin. This is in fact another way Alabasta and the revolutionaries could get along or could team up. They are both very close and trusted with Luffy and it seems that everyone throughout the world that likes Luffy or that has ties 
guys with him gets along. For example, in the reverie, we see Vivi, Shirahoshi, Rebecca, Leo, and many other kingdoms all getting along just because they love Luffy. There is probably a similar bond with Sabo, Robin, and the people of Alabasta that know Luffy. Luffy, or should I call him Joy Boy at this point, brings everyone in the world together. Anyone associated with him is naturally associated with each other as well since they are usually good people with all the Joy Boy and ancient mysteries of the previous Joy Boy being a key part to bringing people together in One Piece. This brings me to my next point. Before this though, I humbly ask you to leave a like on the video if you've liked even one thing that I've said so far. Now let's get into the real good stuff. So the next thing I want to talk about is the destiny of the D-Clan, the Sun God, and their allies. In Alabasta, we see that their flag is a sun with eight circles around it. Now, where have we seen this before? Oh, that's right. We've seen it in both Wano and Shandora, which are both associated with the Ancient Kingdom. We've also seen it on Elbaf ships, which seems to also be a race associated with the Ancient Kingdom and the sun. Now, you may say, well, what does this have to do with the revolutionaries? Well, the first and obvious connection would be that all these people are connected with Luffy. For Luffy, the return of Sun God Nika and Joy Boy is the one that is weaving history and everyone back together. Now, I think you already know this, so let me tell you why this is actually so interesting and how I believe Dragon knows a lot more than we think he knows. So I personally believe that Oars the First is Joy Boy. As you can tell by my name, which is the Wizard of Oars, I pretty much became known on YouTube from this theory. Now you may have heard it around from my older long detailed videos on them, but let me quickly tell you why I believe this. So first off, I call him Ors the First because Ors Jr's Jolly Roger proves to us that he's actually Ors the Third, which would make Ors and Thriller Bark Ors the Second, and then the first original Ors might be Ors the First, whom I believe to be the owner of the head at Onigashima. Yes, I believe Onigashima's head belonged to Ors the First, or in other words, the Joy Boy and Nika from the Void Century. Now, why do I believe he's Joy Boy? Well, first off, Orz's introduction scene in Thriller Bark is exactly like the giant straw hat scene in Marijoa. Moria is carrying Luffy's shadow. Eam is carrying Luffy's wanted poster. Moria walks into a giant special freezer with a similar looking lock to the one in Pangea Castle. Eam walks into a giant freezer with the lock. Orz is at the end of the giant freezer. The giant straw hat is at the end of the giant freezer. With these direct parallels, I believe that the giant straw hat belonged to an Orz back in the Void century. Also, we now know that it definitely could have fit Oars if he did have the Hito Hito Maro Nika fruit since he could have shrunk down to the size of a human with his own abilities. Just like how Chopper and a fox in Wano become humans with their human human fruits, Oars could have done the same. Okay, so the next hint will be that Moria put Luffy's shadow into Oars, which shows that they are similar or have some sort of connection. Another hint is in Marineford, which is when Ace gives Oars Jr. a giant straw hat, foreshadowing that the original Oars may have worn a giant straw hat. The next hint has to do with Shandora. Remember earlier how I said that they have the same logo of a sun with eight circles around it, which Alabasta, Wano, and Elbaf also have? Well, take a look at this. In Skypea, we see that in Upper Yard, they have what the Sky people call Var statues. Now, what do these Var statues look like? Oh yeah. That's right, they look like the Oars race. Now why would the people that worship the sun god have ore statues all over their island? Well, maybe it's because he's the one they were meant to worship. Now let's connect this with the other people that use the same sun logo. First off, Wano literally has Onigashima's head right within its borders. The Elbaf are giants, which means that they most likely have connections with the ancient giants race. I mean, we kind of know that they did, since the Elbaf Jolly Rogers have ores on all of them. Now, I know they wear horned helmets, but still, Oda's the type of guy to have details like this hidden in plain sight. Oda always connects things with wordplay or little details that can mean two different things within his story, so I can definitely see the Jolly Rogers of the Elbaf being a reference to Oars from the Void Century, even though most would probably look at it as a simple Viking reference. Okay, so now with Alabasta, how does Alabasta have any signs of Oars around their island? Well, prepare to be mind blown, as Robin and Cobra are walking down into a secret entrance to find the polyglyph that leads to Pluton. There is a room that has many ancient ruins. Now what's in the middle or in the midst of all the ruins? Oh yeah. 
it's an or skull. So four out of four places that have the sun with eight circles around its symbol have some sort of connection to ors or to onis. So what does that tell you? In my opinion, it tells us that ors the first was the sun god from the void century. Okay, so now to how this is also connected with the revolutionary army. If you take a look at the revolutionary army's flag, what is it? If you take a close look at it, it looks exactly like ors but with wings in the background. Now I know it's supposed to be ors because it has the exact same jawline and face structure as him, with the bottom teeth much wider than the top ones. Now for the wings, I've said in previous videos that I believe they're meant to symbolize the Lunarian's wings and that overall the flag has symbols of the ancient giants and ancient Lunarians. Basically, it's showing who the true rulers of this world were, the sun god and moon gods. This flag is a direct threat to the highest members of the world government. Only those who knew what happened 800 years ago could know what it even represents. So if this is true of their flag, this kind of puts up the questions, how much does Dragon even know and how did he learn this? Well, I'm not exactly sure how he learned it yet, but I do know that he has to know some crazy stuff about the world and it must have been destiny for them to become allied with Alabasta. Alabasta could also probably teach him even more about what he's looking for. Alabasta could definitely teach Dragon many things because of what they seem to be based off of. Alabasta is obviously a country that seems to be based off of Egypt. Well now, you may say, well what does this have to do with what Dragon is trying to learn? Well it has to do with it because the sun god Nika seems to be directly based off of the Egyptian sun god Ra. The sun god Nika may have even originated in Alabasta with the parallels with Egyptian mythology. So first off, sun god Ra wore a sun disc on his head, just like how Luffy wears the straw hat. Not only this, but the sun disc was also inherited to the next gods that ruled Egypt like Osiris and Horus, just like how the straw hat is inherited from Roger to Shanks to Luffy. The next parallel with Ra and Luffy would be that Ra rode on a sun boat in the sky throughout the day, just like how Luffy rides on the sunny boat that can fly through the sky. Another hint is that Ra was the king of the gods, just like how Luffy will be the king of the pirates. Ra rose at dawn and from the east, just like how Luffy rose from Dawn Island in the East Blue. Ra has a secret name, just like the Gamma Gamma Nomi has a secret name, which is the Hito Hito Nomi model Nika. There were two sun gods in Egypt, the first being Ammon, and then Ra carried Ammon's will, just like how there's two sun gods or joy boys with the original from the Void Century and then Luffy carrying his will. Ra was the god of creation, kind of like how the model Nika fruit is only limited by its creativity. Now if you like these connections, Preach was the one who found them and even made two theories on them. If you're interested, I recommend checking those videos out because they are very interesting. But with everything I've now explained, you now understand why I believe that Luffy is based off of the sun god Ra, which means that this sun god term in One Piece may have originated in Alabasta. If it did, then Dragon could find and learn many things that he never even thought could be possible at Alabasta. With Alabasta being the oldest settlement in One Piece dating back to 4,000 years old, they may have knowledge on things during the Void Century, but also even before that. For all we know, they could have knowledge on things like the origins of Devil Fruits, why Skypiea exists, who Sun God Nika is, and why he has a different name from Joy Boy, the origin of the ancient kingdom, and more. Dragon seems to already know some ancient knowledge as he has a tattoo that resembles that of a Skypean or Lunarian. And by the way, he didn't always have this tattoo, which means he got it some time after Roger's death. Maybe he got it after finding ancient knowledge on what happened to all the ancient clans. Alabasta may tell him a lot, and if they are alliances, they can definitely make a formidable team with certain threats that not even Luffy could ever have. For example, Luffy could never get the world on his side by showing them ancient knowledge or by exposing the world government. The majority of people would never believe him since he's a pirate and heinous criminal. However, the revolutionaries and kingdom of Alabasta are well respected among the world, and the people may believe them when they exposed truths of the world and of the celestial dragons. On top of this, once they also got other ancient kingdoms that have the secret emblem of the sun with them, the history that these kingdoms obtain with the influence of the revolutionaries will overwhelm everyone and start a true worldwide revolution. We'll have to wait to see what happens, but now I want to explain another key point connecting things with Alabasta. So now the last thing I want to discuss in this video is about what happened to Alabasta in the Void Century. To start start this part off, let me just tell you very quickly how Alabasta and Dressrosa are two sides of the same coin and why it's important
forbidden to Alabasta's past. So the parallels between each arc would be that each have a warlord that is thought as a hero but is actually a villain. Both have a king that is disgraced or betrayed by their people. Luffy meets his brothers that have the Mera Mera Nomi. Vivi and Rebecca both wanted to fight without hurting anyone. There's an organized crime group that's working undercover. And lastly, there's an illegal substance being used with both the dance powder and sad. So now that you understand how these two arcs are direct parallels and in some ways almost the same, now let me tell you why this is important and the key to the history of Alabasta and the revolutionaries. So first off, just a little detail is that we have Sabo leading the revolutionaries in Dress Rosa and Koza leading his revolutionaries in Alabasta. That is yet again another connection between the two showing that they're connected to each other. In Dress Rosa, the backstory of the country is basically that Doflamingo tricked the entire island by manipulating the citizens perceptions and by having Sugar use the Hobi Hobi Nomi to turn men into toys which takes away the memories of them from everyone that knew them. Many people speculate and believe that this backstory may have foreshadowed how the celestial dragons won the war and made everyone think they were the good guys. They must have done it by changing the perceptions of the public. We even know they do this for sure, especially with there being an actual void century and them erasing people from history. This is all obviously tied with Doflamingo, a celestial dragon erasing people's memories and manipulating everything for them to believe that he is a good ruler. There are many more little details that you can probably find, but you get the point. So knowing this, Dress Rosa is very connected to the Revolutionary Army. In Dress Rosa, we see the Revolutionary Army help Joy Boy show the truth to the country, which is basically what they want to do to the whole world. They want to show the truth to the whole world about the world government and Celestial Dragon's rulership just like how they did in Dress Rosa. They will even do it through Joy Boy or with the help of Joy Boy since he's the rope that links all men. So now you can see how the revolutionary's main goal is all tied back to what happened in Dress Rosa which is probably why Oda showed his revolutionaries for the first time in that arc. So now let's go to Alabasta. In the Void Century, the Nefotari family was at some point Celestial Dragons. Eventually, they switched sides and left the 20 royal families and I believe that how it happened has all been foreshadowed in the Alabasta arc. In Alabasta, Koza and the people of the country are manipulated and tricked by Croc by losing trust for the king and thinking that he's evil. They start to believe in Croc's justice who by the way is a pawn of the world government at that time even though he's the one who's actually hurting the country as a whole. The kingdom of Alabasta can't do anything to convince their people that what is happening is not due to them but is due to something else. Next thing you know, a hope, a light comes out of nowhere to save the people and turn the tides of the war. The warrior of liberation shows up to liberate the people from their ignorant minds and from their defeat to Croc. This warrior shows the whole country the truth of what really happened, how they were manipulated, and then gives them their freedom and happiness back. Because of this, he is called Joy Boy. Now with this exact story, I believe this parallels what happened to Alabasta in the Void Century. There's only one main difference that I'd like to switch. I believe the kingdom of Alabasta represents the ancient kingdom, while Koza and the revolutionaries represent the Nefotari family and Alabasta 800 years ago. Now the reason I believe Alabasta had to be part of the ancient kingdom is because of four main reasons. One, they have the ancient kingdom's main logo. Two, they aren't tied with the world government. Three, they have a Poneglyph. And four, the city of Alabarna was built over 4,000 years ago. The ancient relics in One Piece were usually associated with the ancient kingdom, so I'd assume Alabasta is one of them as well. So with Alabasta being a part of the ancient kingdom, think of the Alabasta Void Century flashback like this. Alabasta was once in peace with the ancient kingdom. A celestial dragon or someone who worked for them convinced Alabasta to start going against the ancient kingdom. They started revolting against their old kingdom and became celestial dragons. While fighting the ancient kingdom for a long time, eventually Joy Boy came around. Joy Boy, the warrior of liberation, the sun god, came to show the Nefotari family the truth. They realized that they were wrong, left the celestial dragons, and realized that they can still redeem themselves in a future timeline by fighting on the right side of the world. They worshipped this man Joy Boy and even wrote glyphs about him in a secret chamber. They waited for his ultimate return just like the rest of the ancient kingdom members. This may possibly be what Cobra wanted to learn at the reverie. The world government probably couldn't tell him everything because it's top secret stuff from the void century. Whether Cobra found it out or not, Destiny has already taken its 
role in uniting Joy Boy with them. Not only them, but also with the rest of the ones that fought on the Ancient Kingdom's side. Joy Boy will connect everything back together. Alabasta will fight alongside the revolutionaries, even if one of their commanders killed their former king. The final world war is coming, which means that secret alliances will come out and show themselves. This may be one of the most important ones altogether with the army that follows the sun. This pretty much wraps up my theory and how Koza and Sabo have a deep connection to the sun god. What do you guys think of this theory? Do you think Alabasta and the revolutionary army will have an alliance? Do you think Ors is Joy Boy and all the references including hieroglyphs and flags are connected to him? Do you believe the Ark of Alabasta foreshadowed how the Nefutari family were celestial dragons and then left to be part of the ancient kingdom? Let me know anything you feel down in the comments below. Also, if you liked even one thing out of this video, remember to like it and even subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. If you want to join the Marshall D. Preach Patreon, the link will be in the description. We talk about recent news and chapters on podcasts. Whenever something comes out, I'll leave the link to the Patreon and any video that I think you'll enjoy. Thanks a lot for watching and please remember to have a great day.